Hello there. Hi, David. Hi, Alan. Hello. Nice to see you. Bye. Oh, can, can you see us or have we disappeared off screen? No, I can see you. Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah, I can see you fine. Grand, that's fine. If you just give us a few minutes until everybody gets gathered um, and then we'll we'll be starting. Alan, to give you um, a heads up, Lorna isn't going to present today, so are you happy enough to just start things off? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Um, I'm using the Cisco Spark and I'm, I'm not sure how to use the on this, so um, uh, a jabber wouldn't work, so yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's great. I've got your PowerPoint here anyway, so we can work it from this end. Um, I believe that Jabber has been replaced by Cisco Spark throughout the university in the summer, um, but we didn't know. <laughs> so well done for managing to get here at all. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, so if you just give us a, a couple of minutes, I think, yeah, we're just waiting on Andrew to come back and then we'll, we'll make a start. Okay, hi Karen, just seeing you at the bottom of the screen. We're still waiting on Dara. Um, so just give him a few minutes. He might be having the same problem with Cisco Spark. Mm. I don't know. I don't know if I used Jabber this morning. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I used Jabber this morning. <laughs> maybe it's phasing out across the network sooner for students than staff. I don't know. Or maybe it's been updated. Maybe. Maybe we think we're using Jabber and we're actually using, using Cisco. Spark. Yeah. Masters tools. Telling me yesterday that I could log in remotely because I was going uh, about losing Photoshop and stuff like that. Um, and he said I'll oh, use Cisco. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I had to go a bit last night. I had to go with Cisco. No. Okay, I think maybe we'll just start because I think we could do with our time because we don't want to run on too long. If that's okay, if Derek comes in, we'll just welcome him. If that's okay. Um, are you happy enough, Alan, for me to work the slides for you? Or you want to try uh, Yeah, please. That'd, be, that'd yeah. be great. Thank you. Okay. So, first up this morning. Um, now, this is, to, to let everybody know, this is quite informal, okay? So, we're not looking for a very big, <coughs> polished, long presentation. It's just sort of 10, 15 minutes on letting us know what you've been doing, what you found out, sort of how you've got on, basically, with only a week to go. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so um, David's looking really calm there because he's not got only a week to go, but everyone else. Here's not a jot. 
Yeah. Yeah. Other, frozen. <laughs> yeah, other people might look slightly panicked. So because it's only a week to go, the idea was that this wasn't going to make an extra burden, but it was just to allow you to sort of give a final account of what you've been doing um, before you submit. Okay, so Alan, would you like me to hear from you first, please? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, well, uh, my, uh, my dissertation is about the counter-reformation um, in the, and using the, the Western Isles as a kind of study, a case study area, and uh, roughly set between uh, the, the time it was between 1550 and 1700, but that, that's very arbitrary. Um, and uh, so it was really just, just to see if the counter reformation is quite well established historically. Um, but it was mainly to see if it was, if you could see archaeologically, it was based on an idea that Mary McLeod had. Um, so, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so yeah, just a bit of background. The Reformation was um, it's it started in the uh, I think uh, I think this is the 500th anniversary this year of the the start of it in, in mainland Europe, and there was just a, a reaction against the Catholic Church, seen as excesses and seen as, as the wrong the wrong way of, of uh, religious practice. So um, in Scotland, uh, uh, there was a lot of conflict in Scotland up until 1560 when they they accepted the Reformed faith, and essentially this was the Protestant Kirk. Uh, replacing the, the Catholic Church, and um, it basically it did away with. It was strongly based on Calvinism, so it did away with uh, with mass, and especially with bishops. They they did they did keep coming back, but they were eventually eradicated as well. Um, so this, uh, um, even though it didn't, it wasn't universal across the country. Though not everyone in Scotland suddenly became a Protestant overnight. So there was many people who remained as Catholics, and this is sort of the basis of the Counter Reformation. I could have the next slide. Um, so the in the Western Isles, the uh, the the main islands of Lewis and Harris, they were they were specifically targeted along with Sky uh, by the the church in Edinburgh uh, from basically from the outset. And uh, um, but the 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 main problem with bringing Protestant to the islands was that there were too few ministers. Uh, the parishes were far too large and. Um, was uh, the, way, the way people were living was they were densely spread across the landscape, so it was really hard for ministers to actually get out to see them all. Uh, sorry, can I have the next slide? Um, so yeah, this this meant that uh, Catholicism could manage to sort of cling on after the Reformation. Um, it did have a big impact because suddenly uh, Churches were no longer maintained. There was uh, priests weren't being were being trained, so it did have an impact on areas that sort of normally remains Catholic. But um, because there were no Protestant ministers going, um, they weren't the faith wasn't being spread to these new areas. And also, there was a lot of opposition from clan chiefs. They were they saw this they saw the Protestant religion as um, as the, the the government in Edinburgh trying to kind of muscle in on. On the Western Isles, because before then it had been part of the Lordship of the Isles, it had been a semi, a semi autonomous state within Scotland. Uh, so it was, it was quite strongly resisted um, by, by the clan chiefs. Um, so, so this, especially in the South Uist and Barra, uh, this meant that uh, the people there were quite receptive to, to missions of, of Catholic priests to come to and just, uh, just renew the faith. I could have the next slide. So yeah, sorry, please ignore the numbers at the top. I'm not uh, But the the Western Isles, the, but in the study area of 1550, 1700, um, people they were living in quite, quite dispersed rural settlements. The I think the the Runrig system that you see today that might have been quite late on. That might have been from 1700 onwards. And the same with nucleated settlements. I think they're still not sure how people did live in this period, but they were really they were really widely dispersed. And uh, so, so this made it really difficult for any kind of organised religion to actually kind of minister these uh, people. Um, it was also the uh, people. It was also the the clan system was the dominant system. <clears throat> uh, this was, and everyone was affiliated to this. Everyone was part of a clan, and um, it really <clears throat> the way people lived and the the way the clan system worked. They both fed into each other. Um, uh, the the way the clan system was uh, organised, it was the ancestral lands that were part of the clan. Uh, they were they were sublet to people. And everyone who's part of the clan, they had a right to these lands. 
And uh, so, so um, this meant that the clan chief, uh, he had a huge role to play in people's lives. And uh, so this is why the decisions made by, by clan elites, especially about what religion they followed, this meant that they're, the, the followers, the, the grassroots part of the clans, they would, they would be strongly affected by these decisions. Uh, sorry, can I have the next slide? Um, yes, yeah, so basically the state of religion um, was that it was largely neglected. Um, even before the, uh, before the Reformation, uh, most of the parishes were, were really understaffed, because, uh, uh, basically because uh, priests, they didn't, want, they didn't want an island mission. They wanted the lowlands. They wanted somewhere where there was money. Um, and uh, another reason was the, uh, the church... Uh, usually churches and abbeys, they owned the churches, like this, the small chapels where people would actually go to. But in the Western Isles, it was very secular. Uh, the lords of the Isles, they were um, secular lords, patronised the, uh, the churches, the, the individual church buildings. So, uh, um, so as soon as this church patronage ended, then the, uh, basically the church fell apart because it needed, obviously the ministers needed money, the church building needed to be maintained. So it all needed resources and money, and as soon as this stopped, then uh, uh, they're, they're just, the whole system would just started to just degrade. Uh, so, so yeah, even before the Reformation and into the 1600s, it was largely just a case of neglect. Just uh, people were essentially left to their own devices, and buildings were just left to just uh, ruin. So I could have the next slide. Uh, so yeah, the um, there were two ways I wanted to try and see of this could be seen, if the Counter-Reformation could be seen um, archaeologically. And the two, the two main bodies of evidence are the, the chapels that I've just talked about, but also the, also the sculpture. Um, in other areas where the, the Reformation took hold, the, you can see the Reformation archaeologically because of iconoclasm. Basically, they, they smashed up images of the previous religion. It's, uh, and uh, images of bishops especially, um, they were seen as idolatrous. Uh, they were seen as representing a false idols. You worship them, you're not worshiping God. And that was one of the big problems with the Catholic Church. So um, uh, the map kind of shows all the all the sculpture, all the crosses in Christian sculpture that's that is in the Western Isles that survives. Um, uh, the two and on Lewis, the kind of the two red dots, uh, they're just place names. So they're not actually physically crosses. They're just place names where a cross may have once stood, and. Uh, so it kind of shows that Lewis and Harris is really quite bare. There's, there are plenty of chapels there. There's about 30 chapel sites there. So, um, so it's, it's highly likely that there would have been a lot of crosses as well because they were used to mark out church precincts. Uh, they were used as way markers. They were used as, um, as just open air gathering sites for, where people would preach. So, uh, as well as grave markers. Um, so, uh, so you you kind of the initial expectation was you see these you see sculpture surviving in Catholic areas, and you wouldn't see in Protestant areas, and that's it's marked out in Lewis and Harris, but on North Uist, which was a Protestant island, uh, that has the most sculpture, which is which is sort of against what I was um, originally thought. Um, so I can have the next slide. Oh yeah, the um, the other thing about on the last map there was. Uh, there is lots of Christian sculpture on Lewis and Harris, and it's mainly in these. It's, uh, these are big memorial stones for clan chiefs, or one of them in, in Lewis is for a clan daughter. Um, and uh, someone wrote that, I read someone who said that uh, the fact that these have survived showed that there wasn't iconoclasm on Lewis, um, which I think is wrong because you don't, you don't have, you don't see these, cro uh, there are no crosses, they're all gone. I think the reason that these survive, even though uh, this one, it does have explicit Christian imagery, like has the apostles of the Virgin Mary. Um, uh, this is all down to the clan system. This is due to clan affiliation. These are, uh, because the clans, they, um, their identity was strongly built in the past. It was all about um, genealogy and ancestors. So this would essentially be smashed in the past. To smash this, even to an ordinary clan, so this would be essentially doing in his own identity so i think that's why these survive um the sorry the cross in the corner that's the one the one cross stone that is on lewis and harris that's a smashed crosshead 
uh, the rest of the shaft is missing. So that may, that may be evidence of a, of a broken stone. Um, so I can have the next slide. Uh, yeah, that just that just um, the bore evidence to us with a graph. That's just so it does confirm what uh, about the uh, what was shown in the map that um, even though the the idea was that Protestant areas would lack sculpture and Catholic areas it would survive, but North US, the Protestant island, shows that um, there's a lot of sculpture survives there. Uh, can I have the next slide? Um, chapels were. Chapels were a lot more missed. I won't talk much about them just because um, there wasn't really much in that. The, um, the, the buildings were fairly uniform. They were small single cell rectangular chambers and that's uniform across the islands. And um, the main thing I was looking for with chapel buildings was uh, the sign of improvements in the southern islands. And in the north, the, where the Reformation took place, you'd expect to see either some kind of damage or you'd see modification like uh, uh, like bicameral cha chambers would be made the the root screen be not down and would just be one one big chamber um, but you apart from at one site uh, it's near Stornoway you don't you don't really see anything there's a uh, um, the way they were built they were lime mortared and they a lot of them had a lime coating on the inside and the outside so they would have they would have been appeared white on the inside, they, it would have been the same, they would have had white walls. And in, in mainland Scotland, these were stripped back uh, because they would have been painted as well. But um, there's no evidence that any of the walls were ever stripped in the Lewis or the Harris chapels. Um, partly because the evidence is so bad, it's so badly uh, maintained. Um, and also the, there's no, um, the chapels in the south, in, in Benbecula, South East, Barrow, the, the, where Catholicism survived, um, the, the buildings there are really badly maintained. They survive really badly. Um, they survive best in Lewis. So, uh, so you're not really seeing any kind of evidence that during the Counter-Reformation chapels were invested in, or new Catholic chapels were built or maintained. So, uh, uh, so yeah, can I have the next slide, please? Um, yeah, and this is this is quite a good example of uh, how the evidence is just quite mixed and ambiguous. Um, bicameral chapels were, um, they're almost like they, they physically embodied how uh, an interior Catholic church a space would work. Um, there's division the uh, from the nave and the chancel, um, and that's, that's to separate the, the bishop or the, the priesthood from the, the lay, just the, uh, the church goers. And uh, this was this is what Protestantism was all about. This was um, there shouldn't be any barrier between people and God. And these buildings they physically make a barrier, as in this 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 blockage between the the nave and the chancel. Um, so I kind of looked at these to see if there was modification, and there there generally isn't. Uh, the only one that survives at all is, is St. John's Chapel in Lewis, and there's no modification to that at all. And, the, and so uh, they were clearly, they were finding a way to still use these chapels, but not the way that mainland Protestant chapels were, were working. Um, so yeah, so it, uh, the chapels, they didn't really show anything. You couldn't really get anything from that. They, there was a very mixed picture across the islands. Uh, sorry, could I have a, the next slide? Uh, yeah, and this just to kind of hammer it home, the uh, the sites were were largely the, it was a similar picture across the islands, and and also the but the the main problem with them is um, I'm looking at how they were in 1700 and earlier, um, and you you can't do that. There's um, we've no idea what they looked like, what the what these state these buildings were in back then. This was 300 years have passed since, so a lot of destruction could have happened in the subsequent. Beards. Uh, so, yeah, so it's uh, not a very accurate uh, picture of, of what's going on. Uh, can I have the next slide? Um, so, yeah, the other thing I wanted to do was, was just to look at how, and because I wasn't getting much from the chapels, was just to look at how people may have perceived these sites. Um, and the, 
even though the uh, the Counter Reformation uh, history books records it really well. So there, there's no doubt that it didn't happen. But uh, you only hear about the, the top level how priests, names of priests and bishops and ministers, how they interact with the chapels, and also the, the names of, of elites. I have chiefs, have no, uh, just landowners um, burying themselves or buying a chapel or patronizing. So you don't, you don't get a picture of how the grassroots would have used these buildings, how they perceived them. Um, so, uh, uh, so the, when these chapels, they would have been, especially the early 1600s, a lot of them would have been neglected outside the, the main, the, the, the buildings that weren't directly patronized by a, a clan chief, uh, they would have been uh, fairly neglected, it could have been ruined. It's also, there's no bishop, there's no priest, there's no minister. There were very few and they were restricted to the main chapels. Um, so it was uh, mainly to, to try and consider how people may have, um, who were actively religious, how they would have used a church building, probably a ruined church building, but with no spiritual guidance, apart from maybe occasionally some direction from the clan chief. Um, so I was kind of considering them as a, from a placemaking point of view, where they would, they would essentially, communities would construct um, the chapel as a, a sacred place, um, based on their own experience and their own needs. Um, and a part of this is they potentially, uh, they could have monumentalized chapel sites. Um, because this, this kind of feeds into the whole clan system thing. It's all about the past. It's not, they're not living in the past, but the past really informs their identity in the present. Um, it's all about clan chiefs. It's all about genealogy and ancestors. For grassroots, it's all about, um, it's all about ancestral lands. So, um, so for a chapel building, they would have remembered that's where ancestors may be married. That's where, uh, where gatherings may have taken place. And they would have also, they, some people would have had a memory of religious sermons taking place here. Uh, so there's a collective memory surrounding these chapel sites. Um, so that would inform how they perceive them and how they use them. Um, but uh, because they're just, they're just static remains, it's, uh, they're, uh, the way kind of monuments are, the, the, the link with the past is made is through public performances. Like if you look at other monuments like the, uh, uh, the Cenotaph in London, um, it doesn't, the, the act of remembering takes place through the, the um, in November, the, the wreath laying, the, the kind of memorial, the last post. It's all about the public performance that actually makes people remember. So, uh, so it's, it's sort of the same with the chapels here. Um, you have public performance like St. Michael's Day um, and the feasting and uh, so if we have the next slide, please. So just to try and get off, try and do this quickly, to give a, an example of kind of what I was thinking um, was to look at Kilvara on Barra. This is the, this is the parish church. Um, by the 1600s, it was ruthless. There was no minister, there was no priest. Um, the, the clan chief was quite, uh, was, was quite contradictory. The, uh, he was a Protestant, but he also, he resented the mainland. He, I think he was, there's an accusation that he murdered the minister that was, that was sent to Barra to convert the people there. Um, so there's very little direct input. They're not being told how they should be worshiping. Um, so they're left to basically construct this by themselves. So they have the church building, which is ruined. It's just the walls, there's no roof. Um, but there'll be living memory though, of, uh, of priests actually leading, leading rites there and taking mass there. So there'll be a memory of that. There'll also be a memory of weddings, events, feasts. Um, so uh, the way this is kind of brought to the present is uh, you can see in St. Bar's Day, this is, uh, this is the, the patron saint of Barra. And uh, there was a yearly celebration which involves basically horse races. And uh, there was also, they're all kind of, and these horse races, they were, they were meant to, uh, they all referenced the church. They were racing, the, the church was like the end point of these races. And it was basically, it marked the high point of the day, which was just um, the celebrations of, of feasting, just basically a uh, communal gathering. And so it was quite a strong public performance. And, uh, and what it was doing was referencing this building 
at this place. It was also referencing the same bar, it was referencing the past. Um, and this all, this all informed the contemporary worship. The, um, the building was, was the place, was the locum, was the focus of their worship. And uh, St. Bar, they, they had a figurine, a wooden figurine, which, which they worshipped. And they would go and they would just, all the, all the communal religious rites, they would involve this, this figurehead. Um, so it's, they basically, they constructed this themselves. They used the past they use their knowledge, they use their own traditions. Um, in the absence of any kind of direct instructions of how they should do these things, they, they basically they did it themselves. Uh, so I could have the next slide. Uh, yeah, so let's just do around. So um, yeah, the conclusions so far. Um, uh, the the Counter-Reformation, it's a bit ambiguous. The, you can see it in the sculpture, the cross sculpture, but not in the chapels. Um, but even then, it's quite mixed. Um, and also, it made me realise that the, the research questions, it was the... I was asking the wrong question, essentially. I think to, to pigeonhole people as either Protestant or Catholic was to ignore um, that they were uh, in, in sort of in, in isolation and, and this lack of kind of proper attention. Um, uh, the, way they, the way they kind of... Their spiritual needs was met very kind of locally. Um, and that's that's the kind of that should be the real focus. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, I'm mindful that we've got quite a few to go through. So does does anyone have a question for Alan at this point? I'm conscious Mary's not here, but she'll get the recording, so um, she can give you feedback. Well, yeah. It wasn't a question so much, Alan. That, that was really enjoyable, really interesting topic. It wasn't a question so much, I suppose, in a way, as uh, just a comment about the uh, the condition and the preservation of those church buildings. Because it struck me that one of the ways in which they might use those churches post-Reformation is to just close down the end of the building that was formerly around the altar where you had that bicameral manifestation. And if that was the case, then you might see that the larger part of the church was maintained for longer and that bit of it went into abeyance and was let. So I wondered even now if the condition relative to the two chambers within the churches, even in their ruinous state, and uh, I totally take your point, there might be nothing to go on here, but I just wondered if, if you could see even if, if one, the larger end of the church was better preserved than the smaller, it might show that they had ignored and they had contracted into one chamber rather than two even in a state of relative ruin. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think you, you possibly would, because they, they clearly they continue to use it, and they must have, they must have found a way. Um, mm. And I think they've, just the fact that it's still standing in such a good condition is, shows that uh, it must have still been used, because so many of them are just, are just foundations now. Mm. So, uh, so, yeah, yeah I, think, um, I think that is something worth looking at, just... Mm. In sort of relation to that, or linking on to that as well, I did wonder, um, in terms of the new church buildings, so the, the more recent buildings, post-1700 then, or, or thereabouts, do you have evidence for the dates in which they're founded, so that you can sort of start to look at when they take over? Um, it's mainly the, the 19th century, I think. Uh, there, was, there wasn't very much church building until the, the Telford churches in the 1800s. Um, I think the the kind of the overall neglect just it kind of continued from from the Reformation in seventeen hundreds and just uh, it just steadily got what just I don't think it got worse but it just it basically stayed in much the same same state I think the more ministers and more priests started to to go to these the islands but um, in terms of new infrastructure it wasn't there wasn't really much building at all until the until the 19th century, and that was only because the government realised just how desperate the need was. Um, but yeah, there, well, there, there was quite a lot. But I had to, I kind of had to pick 1700 as like a, a cut-off point just to stop it. Just uh, so, well. but but yeah, it is it is a process. But there's not a really neat cut-off point. It just it just kept kept going. I think that's interesting in itself. Though that there's just ne the neglect is there, and that's kind of what you're looking at is. Um, how you can archaeologically understand that, um, but it and it's really fascinating. Really enjoyed it. You know that that I hadn't really appreciated the power of the clan system combined with kind of the isolation 
and how that had impacted upon it. And so I'd always sort of felt that in my head the Counter Reformation was something that was quite deliberate. Um, you know, like it was it was against um, sort of the Protestant reform. Whereas it sounds more like what you found is that it was just in a way caused because there wasn't enough Protestantism reaching those places for various reasons. And so it's almost like they were, as you say, left to get on with themselves. Or just backsliding rather than... Yeah, it's just kind of doing what they felt they could. So they might have sort of, rather than it being a deliberate act to push out Protestantism, um, it was as though it just never quite got there. So that, so that in itself is interesting. Can, can I ask a question kind of related to that, that may be out with your, your period of study, but it kind of interests me from what you were saying? You're saying that they're, they're kind of developing their own, almost their own religion. Is there an indication when they then, when you do get the regulated church building in the 1900s, or you know, when they start doing that, that there's a recognition that practices are out of kilter with Protestantism? Are they, you know, are they kind of putting missionaries in to save these people who, who they think are going in the wrong direction? Because again, that kind of you know, would sort of contribute to your argument there, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, I think it was less of people going in, in the wrong direction, but it was, um, there was just, there was a, there was a higher input, there was a greater proportion of their own traditions in, in religious practice. And I think it was, it was slowly pushed out as, as, uh, as ministers and, and priests start to be permanently based on the islands. Then um, the, the, uh, the kind of traditional content would be more and more pushed out. So I think the, uh, the, the St. Michael's Day celebrations, they, were, they took place across all the islands, um, even the Protestant islands, um, even though it, was, it wasn't, it was, it was like a Catholic hangover because it's celebrating a saint, um, having a saint's day. Um, they lasted until the 1800s as well, but uh, before they, they eventually died out. So, uh, uh, so it, was, it was a kind of very gradual process, and it... it um, and it really, it, but it did seem to culminate when they actually started investing in proper buildings, and uh, uh, so yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The, um, so I can't remember what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've answered what I was saying. Yeah. Exploring. Yeah. Well, thank you, Alan. Sounds, sounds like you've. Can got... I just make a comment, Sarah Jane? Yes, please do, David. Yeah. I'm just wondering with what Alan's saying about the development of Protestant practices in the Western Isles, there's actually parallels between that and I suppose the, the, the growth and, and the distribution of early Christianity in general. You know, it's, it's not wake up one day and you adopt new practice. There is a period of change, a hangover from the old ways and beliefs. I just wonder if that's a, a parallel situation. No, I think, I think it is. I think... Um... When Christianity was brought to Scotland, um, uh, even when, uh, like in the, the 500, 600, whenever, um, you could argue people weren't practicing Christianity, they were practicing their own particular traditional religion. They kind of, um, they both appropriated each other, sort of in a way. Um, for Catholic missionaries to spread religion, they had to embrace traditional rites and I suppose you call pagan practices like the holy wells, or um, even the way people were burying themselves. I think the kind of uh, linear burials, east-west burials, that was, you start to see that in the late Iron Age, um, before they, so, uh, so that's not, even that isn't a sure indicator of, of Christianity. Um, so yeah, I think it is, it does parallel it. It's uh, um, when people do kind of, they'll uh, if they're being told something that's completely against their local culture or their traditions, then they will, they will kind of push back against that. So I think you always will see like a, a kind of a local traditional input in any kind of practice. Like, um, like even in Edinburgh, we, we spit in the street. We go past the Hart Middle and we spit in it. And uh, I don't know where that comes from. But it's, you wouldn't find it in any, taught in any uh, religion. Um, but we still I think, all... I think if you're a hip supporter, you might. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we'll need to move on with our time now. Um, I don't see Dara.
on the screen anyway. So, Karen, are you happy to go now? Yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to work the slides from up here for you? Yeah. You're quite quiet. Um, is there any way we can make you louder? <laughs> um, yeah, can you hear her okay? I'm struggling to hear. Can you bring the microphone closer? Can you bring, can you bring your microphone closer? Can we turn ours up a bit more? I don't even know where the microphone is. Okay, we'll turn you up. And then when we do questions, we'll just have to remember because everybody else will yeah. be very loud then, okay? Is there one on the ceiling at all, Karen? Is it one of those ones where there's a strip on the ceiling with tanned there? There's like a little thing that sits on top of the telly, so the, the, for the camera. Yeah. So I don't know if it's part of that. That's fair. That's yeah. better. Yeah. 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 Okay, so um, Karen's going to talk to us about feasting in Iron Age Scotland and just if, remind us all to turn off our um, mics while Karen's presenting, apart from Karen, obviously. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so I'm going to give a bit of background information for those that don't know what I've been looking at. Um, feasts have become an increasingly popular topic in archaeology. Feasting plays an important social, economic and political role in society and can offer an insight into the social relations and processes in ancient societies. People negotiate relationships, pursue economic and political goals and compete for power through feasting. Next slide. So my main aims were to identify episodes of feasting in the Scottish Iron Age using zooarchaeological evidence from selected sites. Explore whether different types of feasts could be identified via the faunal record and assess how zooarchaeological evidence for feasting informs our understanding of Irish society in Scotland. Next slide, please. Um, my objectives were to examine the body of literature surrounding feasting in order to better understand different types of feast and their purpose, create criteria to identify feasting and the nature of feasting, record and analyse data sets of the animal bone associated with Rosemark Man and the whalebone vessel found at Cairns. Um, uh, these data sets have been put into Excel and examined against criteria that I have set up in order to identify feasting and the nature of feasting episodes of these sites. Next slide, please. Yeah, so Rosemarkey Man was excavated in the 2016 season of the Rosemarkey Caves project as part of the North of Scotland Archaeological Society. He was dated between the 5th and 7th centuries AD. He had excessive injuries to his head and he showed no evidence of defending himself. This, amongst other evidence, led excavators to believe he was a deviant burial, i.e. a burial that was different to others. He was buried in an alcove of the cave with stones weighing down his arms and legs and deposits of animal bones were laid over his head to his, to his left shoulder and another over his body. These animal bones were identified at by the excavators as a potential feasting episode. The Cairns excavation is part of an ongoing archaeological research project investigating the later prehistory of the Winnick landscape on the island of South Rockensee on in Orkney. Since 2006, excavation has focused on the Brock and associated structures dating from the Iron Age through to the Norse period. In 2016, a human anvil was found within a way of Vessel resting against this vessel were two complete antlers. This deposit was situated against the outer wall face of the brook near the entrance. Within and close to this vessel was a small bone assemblage which has been identified as a possible feasting episode. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so these are the comparative sites that I used. Um, Dunvulin was excavated between 1991 and 1995. 
examination of the animal assemblage indicates that the inhabitants of the brook were receiving much of the meat from communities out with the brook, with the dominance of front leg joints suggesting that some of this would have come to the brook's pre-cut joints as a tribute of contribution to a feast. Um, Old Scat Ness is a multi-period site located on Shetland and was excavated between 1995 and 2006. The zoo archaeological remains from phase four of the brook appear to indicate in at least this the main context and possibly all um, were the result of a special activity. The butchery, age data, body part representation, taphonomic evidence indicates that whole cattle and prime joints of meat of beef, pork and lamb were eaten and deposited quickly. This has been suggested as a, as a feasting event whereby joints of meat were brought into the settlement and the remains deposited. Due to the limitations of the available data, species representation and individual elements will only be the only data which can be used as a comparator between these sites and the two sites where I have undertaken full analysis of the faunal assemblages. Um, the 2000 to 2006 excavations at the site of Minehow and Tyconess on mainland Orkney uncovered a subterranean stone structure sunk into a natural glacial mound. It was surrounded by a ditch measuring 41 metres north to south and 37 metres east to west. No domestic function was found. Uh, for the purposes of this dissertation, only the upper ditch pools, which have been identified as a large single context deposit of bone. It has the possible, it is possible that the bone assemblage, or at least some of it, may indicate evidence of feasting. Next page, please. Um, so the first thing that I did was record all the data from the Cairns and then Rose Markey. So I identified species, um, anatomical elements, um, whether there was any whether there were any articulated deposits, and I looked at the butchery and the fracturing, to undertook fracturing analysis on the bones. Uh, next page, please. Uh, apologies for lots of text on, on the PowerPoint, but I just wanted to show what I've set up for the uh, criteria for identifying feasting. Um, these are the types of beasts that I've identified as most recognisable within the archaeological record using only zoo archaeological evidence. Hastorf has described potluck beasts as beasts among equals in which each person takes a dish to share. These meals can be small and simple or large and abundant with a large variety of dishes. Therefore, there would be a wide range of remains in the deposit. Alliance building beasts have various names in the lecture the literature, patron client, patron role, promotional alliance, and commensal feasts. They emphasize the higher status of the host and they often occur in special cultural moments such as births, weddings, or funerals. They highlight the host status within its society. Next page, uh, PowerPoint, please. Uh, Competitive feasts are most recognisable in the archaeological record. They're designed to promote status differences through different ingredients. These feasts make differences obvious amongst the elite. Next page. So these are some of my results. I haven't shown that many because I didn't want to show loads and loads of graphs. Um, uh, as you can see, the assemblage on the nose marking shows that the vast majority of bone identified was cattle, 73 out of 75 bone fragments. The other two were identified as horse. Um, whereas the animal representative representation in the cairns is quite diverse in comparison. Although there is a dominance of sheep and goat, 15.82% of the total assemblage. Next slide, please. 
at time building, although sheep, goat are the dominant species, which is what you would expect in an iron age assemblage, 22% of that is pig, which is higher than the other sites in this region and therefore must be significant. Uh, at old scat nest, it shows that cow is by far the dominant species, and again, it's the case of Meinhout in the uppermost layers of the ditch. Next page, a slide please. Um, some of the difficulties that I've found are differentiating between beasts, especially the alliance building and competitive beasting. Um, beasts can have more than one meaning. For example, while beast may appear to be associated with the death of a person within the community, it can be more about reasserting the host status. Um, and not having access to raw data uh, meant that you're not really comparing like by like with like. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, well, we open it up for questions. Does the supervisor want to have a first question? I, I could try a first question. Um, I could. I have a couple of questions actually. Um, would you would you like to try and make any stab at what kind of feast do you have represented by either Rosemarkey or the Cairns? Or do you think it's going to be too difficult to do that? I think they both look like competitive feasting. I think the unusual of the deposit, the, well, Rosemarkey being mostly cattle. And the two horse bones are quite strange as well, although they're not butchered, so I, but they didn't get there by accident. And the cairns, there's a lot of neonatal bones, and that's also quite unusual. I haven't yet compared neonatal bones of the cairns to anywhere else, though. I know there was some spoken about that done pulling, no scat nice maybe. Do you think the Cairns is feasting? <laughs> That's a really bad question to ask you at this stage, isn't it? <laughs> um, because of the neonates, I mean, that's what I'm... It, it meets the stat, the, like, the criteria that I've set up, so... Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. You I mean, can't. Yeah, it's all right. It's a meal. I just put it in that way, though. But I don't think it is obviously special in some way. It depends what you classify as a feast, I suppose. How big does it have to be? And it could be very small. I mean, you're I you can identify very small episodes of feasting, so I think that's, that's a good point. So can I ask about distinguishing? Because you've, you've got two different types of sites, so what about distinguishing between? Um, food items that might be accompanying a grave, so um, offerings or grave goods, if you like, compared to um, the remains of, of food that's being actively consumed and, and um, yeah, the living populations participating in it. So, yeah, I mean, Rosemarkey is obviously associated with that um, sacrifice, deviant burial, and yeah, the care this has got the human mantle, so they're both associated with death. But death is obviously much easier to see in the archaeological record than like birth or marriages or coming of age ceremonies or anything like that. It's also, <coughs> excuse me, at the Cairns, it's, it's not only the death of that individual, but the death of a major monument as well, it would appear. So, you know, that's really intriguing. What are they really celebrating there? Is it, is it to do with the deceased human or is it to do with the deceased site? And I don't think it's a burial as such in relation to the human. I think it's a funeral for the monument more than the, than the person. So I don't know whether that has a some kind of knock-on effect on the types of food remains, therefore, or re food residues that are used in that um, funeral. Yeah, it almost brings to mind a kind of 
lesser portions of food or token portions of food that you get, things like the structure tent at the nets, arguably with the tibia, or even in a modern parallel or a recent parallel, the Chinese um, money of the dead, where they use the monopoly money effectively to give offerings to the dead rather than real money kind of thing, I don't know. Do you think they were consuming the the re, the refuse that's left at Rosemarkey and or the Cairns? Uh, I think so. There's butchery marks, a lot of butchery marks on the Rosemarkey bones. It's very high, isn't it? Actually, that's correct. Um, am I correct in remembering that it's a very high uh, percent? Yeah. About almost 20%. Because when I worked it out as going from the whole assemblage, it was less than we thought. And we had just worked it on the class. It wasn't 40%, so it's just as well in our sports too. From the small amount of work that's been done in the wider animal bone at the Cairns, it looks like butchery is very low in, in its instance. So it's not necessarily dealing with the same contemporary deposits. That's the only caveat there. You know, not necessarily the same period of animal bone, but it looks like there's very little processing or butchery marks in relative terms. Oh, of the you need to butcher it? I don't know. Well, one argument was that <clears throat> the lack of butchery marks be token status because they're being very wasteful because they're not processing it to within an inch of its calorific value, mm-hmm. as it were, so that it's an indicator of status or wealth. But And so yeah, it's I if, if there's butchery or not. Of neonatal bones, anyway, you, you wouldn't get much bone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Karen. Um, it's really interesting. Yeah. Could I borrow a memory stick or somebody to get the PowerPoint? Uh, please. Um, I don't have one. I can, I can give you back I'll do the one. If we can. Uh, thank you, Karen. Yeah, you can relax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, if we take a few minutes now, just until 12, quick break, and then come back in, if that's okay. And I'll see if I can find Dara. <laughs> so I'm a bit worried he's maybe just not managed to join us. Okay, so if we take five minutes and back in at 12. So I've got to leave a wee bit early because I'm working. Okay, I'm thanks, working. Karen. Thank you. Three to go.
Right. Were you expecting Simon? Yeah, I was expecting okay. Simon. This is recorded, yeah? Yes. Hi, everybody. That's us back in. Do you want... The only thing is that it's... You were scheduled to be on at 20 past, so unless Simon's just going to come in, then... Do you want me to ring him? Um, well... Or do we put Andrew come in? Yeah. Andrew, do you want to go first? Before, and then it just means yeah. if Simon's coming in, he doesn't yeah. ask. Yeah? Is that okay? I'm sorry about this, Andrew. Sorry. You said you didn't want to go last. So <laughs> <laughs> you're just throwing my words back at <laughs> Do you want to come in, Andrew? Yeah. Okay. Don't say I never do anything for you, yeah? I owe you. Oh, okay. Did you get there? Um, he can't get through using, oh. he's tried and hasn't managed to. That's a damn nuisance. So, so it's probably this. Um, and he said it worked yesterday, yeah. isn't working today. So, oh, why is this not working? I'm just going to do a slideshow. I was doing a slideshow. Oh, just, sorry. Yeah. It's um, <laughs> a left hand thing. Please. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, everybody. My dissertation was on a uh, spatial. Temporal analysis of the ferrous and non-ferrous metallurgy of the cans on Saturnalty. Uh, it was a really interesting topic uh, and went well, which is good. Um, as you can see from the uh, front picture, then uh, quite a lot of it was based around moulds that were used for uh, uh, making bronze objects such as uh, the one on the front, a penannual brooch. Uh, the Cairns is down on the uh, southeast, southeast coast of South Ronaldsy and just inland. And um, to say something about it, it's a, uh, for those who don't know, I know Karen does know, uh, it's quite a large site. It's got a broch, it's Middle Iron Age. Uh, the area I was looking at, uh, Trench M, uh, the metalworking took place on rubble that was a, uh, a building, um, most probably, that had been uh, demolished or had become rubble through some process but the metalworking was taking place on top of that and the debris uh, I was looking at was on top of that. Uh, the aims were discovering the relationship between the ferrous and the non-ferrous metal workers and uh, to discover the temporal and spatial relationship between the pins and the brooches. Uh, the first aim went quite well, the second aim didn't, uh, for reasons that I'll sort of talk about. This is, these are examples of the clay moulds that I was looking at. These are um, two really good examples. The one on the left, the penannula brooch, it, you can see, uh, hopefully, that uh, penannula meaning uh, circular, but doesn't meet up, and the two terminals are down the bottom, uh, and there's just a very thin raised bit of clay uh, that would hopefully stop the uh, the bronze meeting up. Uh, the terminals are uh, bulbous, uh, and uh, the one on the right uh, is a projecting ring-headed pin. I, you, it's possible to see the projection. Uh, Part where uh, the uh, the shaft would have 
projected up. Uh, that uh, that was studied last year by another master's student, Ben Price. Um, I'll come back to those two. Okay, uh, the objectives were categorizing and cataloging uh, the metalworking assemblage, principally the molds. Uh, they hadn't been catalogued before. Um, and then entering that catalog into a 3D ArcGIS representation of the trench. And then I wanted to carry out a spatial and network analysis of the 3D GIS model. Uh, I think I managed to address all of those objectives. I came up with a methodology that, uh, that did so. Uh, the 3D art GIS representation took way longer than I thought it would, like <laughs> uh, hours, days, weeks longer than I thought it would. So I don't know whether I would attempt that again. Uh, I would try something different in a methodology uh, that I was doing, but the results of the temporal analysis uh, were maybe the least, uh, I got the least out of this. Uh, the penannular brooch mold types that were found were uh, described in the text that I found as chronologically undiagnostic, uh, which wasn't exactly great. Uh, <laughs> you know, like I, re I read that and I was like, oh. <laughs> um, but uh, thanks to Martin, uh, I um, now know that it was of a type that's not uh, previously been known to be manufactured in Orkney and uh, in 2005 a PhD was done that uh, looked at um, uh, all mold types known <coughs> sorry, all types all mold types known in Scotland in the Iron Age uh, and in the catalogue there is no uh, no mention of uh, well, their type A uh, there's no mention of type A. Um, so, uh, the manufacture of that type is not attested to in that magisterial uh, um, catalogue of mould types in Iron Age Scotland. Uh, the projecting ring-headed pins are pin moulds. Uh, the same thesis uh, argues well as two two arguments, one for first and second century AD, and the other for uh, fourth or fifth. Uh, and uh, the thesis uh, suggests that fourth or fifth is more likely based on uh, mold types find at, found at Mine How, uh, which is interesting. Uh, so uh, that sort of gives a, um, a probable or possible date for the non-ferrous metal working at the Cairns. Uh, anyway, uh, the spatial analysis showed uh, that uh, although the, the contexts, uh, the main contexts that were dug in Trench M are quite quite large. Each one had um, a very a very distinct uh, pattern of um, um, uh, discard a uh, very uh, very distinct discard pattern for the non-ferrous metal working. So uh, Ah, insert picture. 
um, the um, okay that is trench uh, sorry context 1307 uh, that has a uh, the uh, two groups uh, if I had included uh, another context <laughs> then uh, there would have been an equally distinct um, pattern. Uh, which way am I going? That way. Uh, that is a 2D snapshot of a 3D, um, the 3D model. Uh, the, I don't know, is it turquoise? It's the moulds uh, further up um, uh, to the left and also further up, as in height-wise, uh, and the blue is slag. So uh, the ferrous metalworking debris occupies a different place in the context, in the trench, uh, than the moulds do. Uh, the moulds do. Uh, and the moulds are not, inter not overly intermingled, and uh, they do sit above the uh, above the slag, the end of the trail of slag. So they do represent a different activity episode. And that is something that in if you looked in plan, if you looked um, 2D GIS, you would not be able to See, it would just be a, a jumble of dots. Uh, and uh, it is, however, in plan you can see that uh, the area where non-ferrous metal workers were breaking open their moulds and the area where ferrous worker, uh, metal workers were disposing of their, their debris and also uh, where the bogor is located, they're very, um, very distinct. So, uh, there is, um, a, it's not completely possible to say where <coughs> those two groups of people were working, but it is possible to say where the artifactual um, evidence um, shows that the debris was disposed of. Uh, it is different, but it is, uh, it is interesting and it is meaningful. Uh, the orange up there uh, is the group of mould fragments and that is um, around where the moulds were being broke open, broken open. Uh, the blue is the bogor, it's located down in one, grouped in one area, um, but there is scatter. Um, Then uh, the red is slag, and there's quite a lot of it. <laughs> um, but uh, okay, the results of the network analysis were really interesting, and finished off about two nights ago. <laughs> uh, okay, furnace two might have been used for non-ferrous metal working as well as ferrous metal working. That is suggested by three mold fragments. So it's not a sort of categorical um, um, idea by any stretch of the imagination. It's a, uh, a three non-diagnostic mold fragments uh, found in the furnace to um, structure area. Um, sorry, there are two areas 
in the metalworking um, trench that may have been furnaces, have identified, been identified as possible furnaces. Um, the moulds were cracked open at one spot and they were cracked open on a small rise. Uh, sometimes the moulds broke open and um, sort of uh, broke open fine and were reusable and sometimes uh, the moulds broke open and fragmented. Uh, and when they, uh, when they fragmented, uh, the larger bits fell at the feet of the people who were doing the, doing the work. And then the smaller the, the crumbs uh, were discarded down the slope. And... Could I have the mouse, please? <laughs> Thanks. <coughs> What we have here is a 3D model. Uh, there were five. There were five lines on there of different colours, and there were five. We I was able to well Ben did one last year. Ben Price, Leonie T uh, Tufel, uh did one, and I did three uh, rejoins of. Um, Molds, mold fragments, and uh, the coloured dots are either penannular brooch mold fragments, uh, the top of a ring, or a simple ring, or just a large bit. The black is undiagnostic, um, under eight gram small stuff. So if you look in three dimensions, you can see that the big mold fragments or the, the mold fragments which are identifiable are on a top of a rise and all of the lines point downhill. So how does this work? And when I said I wouldn't do a, uh, a an art GIS, uh, I wouldn't do it the way I did it again. Uh, that is the product of a hundred individual shape files um, taken to a different height. Each one taken to a different height, and each one um, extruded. Um, down um, like a certain number of centimetres uh, and taking levels off plans and then taking a f another uh, 50 different levels um, out in the field uh, horrendously uh, lengthy process to come up with something which um, suggests uh, the structure of the trench but still leaves a lot to the imagination. Uh, and there are places where I would really have liked to have um, gone and got a label there so that I can come up with a little bit more information or a better idea. But that's in retrospect. Uh, what is possible is 
to put in um, photogrammetry into ArcGIS. And if I was to do it again, then I would try and get a photogrammetric model of Trench M and put that into ArcGIS. And then I can, um, or it is possible to, um, to put the, um, all of the artifacts which have had their positions taken in three dimensions using the total station into the same model doing t exactly the same thing and then you'd be looking at an animation of moulds with a, a photogrammetric model of the trench underneath which is also going round in three dimensions and it would be enormously more useful for analysis. Uh, Okay, uh, so uh, the ferrous metal working took place multiple episodes over a lengthy period of time uh, without dating evidence. Um, it's impossible to say how long. Uh, and the non ferrous metal working took place during one episode. Uh, the the actual depth of the deposit is centimetres and uh, it's, yeah, it's centimetres. Uh, uh, the output of uh, that one episode was uh, corrugated projecting ring-headed pins, penannular brooches and simple rings and in order to have that variety of output in one episode, it must have been a, a group with um, fairly good social status who wanted, to, who wanted to sort of project that social status. Uh, they were getting a variety of sort of at least fairly elite goods. Uh, and so they would have had uh, a decent amount of money as well. Um, money, uh, wealth, or uh, whatever in order to get that. Uh, there's evidence of non-ferrous metal working from the Cairns, Meinhau, Midhau, Lingro, and the Broch, uh, at least. Uh, and uh, the reciprocity of items such as all of those uh, that I've just mentioned uh, and the movement of itinerant metal workers because one episode uh, would not, they would not have supported uh, non-ferrous metal workers full-time if there's only one episode happened. Uh, so the movement of those itinerant metal workers plus all of the items would have um, uh, formed a, a bond within a uh, sort of uh, social system um, in the Middle Iron Age um, around sites uh, such as those in Orkney. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Will we, does Martin want to open up questions? And by all means, yeah. Can, can, you tell, can you tell people just roughly how many moulds there were? Because you never quite mentioned how, uh, many, how many there were. Okay, uh, including fragments... Uh, Fifty-eight um, diagnostic, um, as in identifiable as something, anything, even a pin shaft, uh, part of a pin shaft, uh, uh, more like uh, in the twenties. Uh, uh, but then uh, the number that could be actually refit together um, was eleven. So. When you get 20% of um, the number can be refit together to form something, then uh, other, other sort of um, sites which have had moulds excavated have not had that sort of uh, 
20% able to be refit, 40% diagnostic. Uh, they haven't had, they might have had, um, Old Scatness had uh, 90 moulds, but it didn't have that sort of percentage of uh, quality of quality, <laughs> you know, quality over quantity. And, and also the moulds at Old Scatness were not accompanied by any other substantive metalwork and evidence, so there wasn't the smoking gun of crucibles and copper fragments, and it looked like the moulds from Scatness had been removed from their context of production and then deposited somewhere else, and it was in the remains, the rubbly remains of a building. So it does, you would see that as at the Cairns, the evidence is pointing to, we're looking at the direct, a direct window on literally where um, that metalworking was occurring, which is which is ideal. Which is well, that 3D model just suggests, mm -hmm. and there's um, one, uh, the second Penanula brooch mould, which I didn't show, uh, where there's evidence that they shoved a knife into it to crack it open, and uh, there's the one that I did show, which is good quality. Uh, the other side is the, obviously the side that cracked, and it's the mould where they shoved the knife in and damaged it, which is down the slope, so you can... I mean, my pic the picture in my head, at least, is shoved the knife in, <laughs> wham, down the slope. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, I like the 3D model uh, sort of shows for me um, a small rise on a midden or something like that and uh, just <coughs> that's where you that's where they were standing doing the moulds. Sorry, he's asking for the dialing code. Don't say what it's on. Let's to I'm 51020. 51020. How do you know? Yes. Could you, how do you know? that it was different individuals involved in the first and non first metalworking <laughs> versus just simply spatial a spatial distinction maintained between the tasks of ferris and the tasks of non first metalworking? Because well, I mean, I cannot categorically say. Mm -hmm. uh, but you make if, a hypothesis at the beginning though, that seems quite clear in one of your introductory statements that you wanted to look at the relationships mm -hmm. between this group and this group. And so yeah, my question was, How why you are you that? assuming there's two separate groups? And I, I say this from the point of view of knowing nothing about metalwork, so I just want okay. to put the background as to um, this. I think it needs to be set out quite clearly in your text. The uh, technical, mm, the technic, the technicalities of ferrous metalworking, and then the technicalities of non-ferrous metalworking. And in a culture where you had to learn those, each of them, well, yeah, uh, and where neither of them uh, were, from the evidence, full-time activities, at least in that place. So, uh, somebody could have uh, held both in their heads, been trained in both, uh, orally, uh, and through doing, and uh, say, the equivalent of an apprenticeship, mm -hmm. uh, and then being itinerant in both, and not full-time at any one spot in both. <coughs> uh, okay. But that's, you know, like, I wouldn't be able to do it, but then, you know, I'm not the most practical person. Uh, but uh, if they can do that, then that would be a, um, that would be a scenario. Otherwise, you would have uh, somebody trained, an expert in this technology, somebody, people trained an expert in this technology, people trained an expert in this technology, Itinerant. Uh, I cannot say categorically.
Because one of the things you did say, which is interesting, is that there was a small number of moulds close to one of the furnaces. And the furnaces are for iron working, so they're for ferrets working. So the possibility is that they're sharing facilities, regardless of the specific mm -hmm. identities or technical specialisms of the individuals involved, and that they're using the furnace that's already heated up and charged for the metal, for the iron working to bring the moulds, to, to heat the moulds up prior to casting, or pouring rather, and then after that to, to nudge them and nurse them over the longest yeah. period of time um. that they're needed. So they're, they're, inter, they're potentially interrelated regardless of their specific professional identities or technical specialist identities, which is nevertheless really interesting. Yeah, uh, the um, bronze workers turn up when they know that the, um, the furnace is going to be charged because... Um, it's a fairly small island, and uh, they've heard that uh, the the ferrous metal workers are not in town, but you know, <laughs> they're they're there. I think you're missing a trick there because you're talking about hearsay. When on the other hand, you've said that the production of these items is a high status, prestige, highly valued practice. It's far more likely that whoever's instigating that process, whoever the patrons are resident on the site are actively going out and making sure that they've got these services at the right moment in time and you're underplaying your own results there because what you actually want to be saying I would imagine is that the organisational aspect of mustering those two tasks together and, and doing that production simultaneously extols the virtue and the value of that process all more so and of the community and the people who are orchestrating that process and instigating it okay. so rather than the, sort of, the bronze workers hear that there's iron working going on it's somebody somewhere's got an agenda and they're pulling all that resource together to make this happen and that's mm -hmm. part of the value of thing, I would say. You know? And that's that's totally in line with what you've got as a, as a set of results. It's just you need to play that even more and you know, mm -hmm. make that point, I think. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not overplaying things, I'm underplaying things. Maybe a little bit there, perhaps, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We need to move on. <laughs> right. um, is that Carl James? Presentation. Yes. Uh, so, I'll try and find it for you. Well, I've obviously upset Ingrid. <laughs> <laughs> just frightened her, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Hang on just a second. Just say, Hello, Simon. Nice to see you. Hi, sorry, earlier I had the wrong, the wrong dialing code. Sorry about that. Yep, no, that's quite all right. Um, okay, so our last presentation this afternoon now <laughs> um, is Carl James. So I'll just leave it for you to tell us how you've been getting on and what you've been doing. Just going to double check my technology. There you go. Everybody seeing this? Um, I'm Carl James Lankford. I've uh, I've been introduced to um, Simon, who's my supervisor. So uh, hello, Simon. Not that we spent a whole day together in the week. Um, so, we're going to be looking at a comparison of the use of space within two near contemporary but widely separated settlements. The Ditches Roman Villa complex at Baggerton, Gloucester and Skatnes Brock, Shetland. Skatnes Brock and <coughs> Settlement, um, which is, there you go. We're, we're looking all the way down here. Reference purposes, we're referring to it as Scatness, and um, obviously on the wonderful island of Shetland. And um, stark contrast between the two landscapes, and we're looking at uh, Bagadon. Um, and Bagadon um, is roughly around here. Um, I've still got to tweak this um, for the dissertation purposes. But you've got two widely um, distinct distinct sites, uh, two different um, areas of the country. Um, introduction. The methodological approach taken will include that of spatial syntax, Hillier, Hansen, um, 1984, with a, a bridge work by Foster, 1989, with a comparison against Ingold, 1993, perception of landscape and tarscape and Rappaport, 1990. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with these names. Archaeology is multidisciplinary, and in many ways this work demonstrates that. 
Rappaport can be seen to offer his explanation of landscape and tarscape through a range of references familiar to thespians. Uh, some of you will be aware of the words landscape and tarscape are, are words that Ingold uses. Ingold makes references to understanding the past using a phenomenological appro approaches. He does use the metaphor that is to be found in art, um, in particularly uh, Peter Bruegel, the elder, in his 1565 work, The Harvesters. Moreover, architecture are the uh, predetermin predeterminant uh, concerns of Hillier et al. Architecture in terms of visual styles, its far-reaching practical effects are not at the level of appearances at all, but at the levels of space. Hillier um, offers to give shape and form to our material world. Architecture structures the system of space in which we live and move. Architecture has a powerful syntax to social life. Here we go. There's Scatness. Um, I visited Scatness for the first time this week. But it's a site that I've, I've uh, become to know. Um, it's this building here that we're looking at, uh, which is structure 12. And there's structure 8 as well. There is the huge Brock structure. We move on. Uh, here's a, a little introduction of the methodologies. Ingold and Rappaport. Entering the world of Ingold, 1993, at times alongside the work of Rappaport, 1990. We journey through the concepts of time and landscape, which are um, simply not one um, dimensional, I should say. We look at a journey at the ditches and scatness in phase two, at the ditches, and phase five B at scatness, respectively. Human life develops as a multifaceted passage of time, which in turn, alongside natural factors, um, forms the landscape, uh, which its form is an integral part. Enshrining the temporality of landscape, within it as part of the many layers of everything we find the dwelling perspective. The ensemble that has left a time sign of its temporal passing is to be seen as a record of passing occurrences within this multifaceted landscape. Only parts of the dwelling perspective, its time sign, are e examined within a limited landscape here. The landscape is a storybook that has and can appear at different times with actors involved in the writing of the book. Each generation writing a new page in the book for allowing this concept to enhance our shared knowledge of the past, we must be wary that this could change with new evidence. History is forever being rewritten, very much as an Oscar-winning film is performed as a new version. Whatever version of the journeys that are explored here, these are a variable and as temporal as Ingold's temporality of landscape. The ditches. Now, this may sound silly to some of you in the room, some archaeologists that might ignore these little delicate nuances of the past, daub, bricotage. I've known archaeologists that would simply chuck this into spoil heaps, but this as a piece of archaeology for Ingold and Rappaport are essential for the textural fabric of a structure, understanding our real past, other than those little bits of meaningless pottery that most archaeologists uh, have a tendency to lay their claim upon. Bits of pottery like this. But I'm more interested in texture. The, the stonework itself. What's underfoot? What's above you? What's around you? However, Helia, oh, little spelling mistake there. Helia Hansen, Peponis Foster, the principle of which archaeologists attempt to reconstruct past lives and their experience within structures can be both varied, overcomplicated, and without, at times, a scientific basis. This is somewhat addressed using a methodology that is mathematical and inhuman, using the social logic of space a work created in 1984 by the co-authorship of Hillier Hansen, a Peponis, to assist in understanding the archaeology of the two sites here, was at first glance not the task that the name of the author, myself, 
uh, with a great deal of enthusiasm. After all, how could anyone understand a building using specialist rules governed by a set of analysis? When it had been previous for the author to use uh, more of a phenomenological approach. However, after some interpretation by the author myself, this methodology does say a great deal more about a building which can be said to have both a function that should, in effect, according to Hillier, offer some understanding of its form, its contextual workings, and what can be societally so 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 inferred from them. Sorry. Um, here we go. Um, Scatness justified access analysis. Um, I was cutting and pasting this last night. It doesn't look complete. Anyway, uh, um, early wheelhouse configuration. This is structure 12, phase 5A, which is phase 1 for us in this. At Scatness, western entrance with short piers. So there's the western entrance. This is my phase 1 justified access analysis map with labelled spaces based on uh, Foster and Hillier and Hansen. You can basically see the access there, the levels of permeability. Uh, you've got the sense of the carrier space. This is where you'd enter the structure. Uh, Simon wasn't too pleased that I had another um, sort of um, carrier space, but um, this is my interpretation. Um, you've got a transitional zone here. You've got a sub-transitional zone here, a communal zone. That's the central space, the central hub of a structure. I've got um, several levels of these justified maps in the dissertation. Here we go. Overview. With such a limited format, a 15,000 word thesis, I got up to 25,000 words and I'm now uh, desperately still editing. And time to undertake this work, it has not been possible to entertain complete analysis of the settlements, principal structures at either of the sites here, i.e. the Broch and the wider landscape at uh, Bagadon at the ditches. So we've concentrated on two sites here. There are problems inherent in the archaeology also. It is assumed that both sites would have demonstrated considerable depth of access. One of the methodologies used here, but the ditches does um, exhibit their negative profile over Scatness, which exhibits remarkable positive profile. Above ground levels survive to a remarkable height. Therefore, uh, there would be a considerable level of guesswork regarding the ditches using all the methodologies utilised here. On the contrary, however, if both data sets had offered considerable preservation of archaeology, talking more about ditches, uh, which would be extremely beneficial for Ingold and Rappaport and Foster. On the other hand, um, uh, on the other hand, would argue that analysis would become increasingly abstract and complicated if we've got all the data set. Let's go into the leather. Um, leather artifacts is here which are not available at either site. Access analysis becomes more effective as a means of understanding the past when no documentary sources are available foster. Uh, here we go, levels of depth. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this. Um, it would be great to go into the complete dissertation here but I'm not going to but you've got the levels of depth here. Um, I'm going to introduce a little bit of the conclusion here anyway. Um, it turns out that the levels of depth are extremely more complicated at Scatness. And they're extremely more complicated at Iron Age sites per se, over Roman sites in the south. Um, here we go. Could this be the outcome? This work will demonstrate that it is hoped that the ditches in Scatness will be comparable at levels of methodological analysis and phenomenology. I don't know how many of you can say that. It is also understood that the materials used at both structures, although not totally comparable, uh, uh, were to be seen as remarkably different than a generation before. It may be possible to see how much the use of light can be seen to demonstrate control of the two structures, and that a Roman structure may be as controlling over its users, insiders and outsiders, as at Scatness. But you know what? The conclusion was very different. The answer is no. Roman Britain was far more at home with itself than a dark, controlled Shetland lifestyle. The first thing I come across entering this brook uh, was a very dark, controlled landscape, moving from the dark, uh, moving from the light to darkness, and if there's no fire in it, you don't know where the hell you're going. Conclusion. Within the context of Scatness, there is a full, very full use of all available space, Foster. 
However, the use of space is not crammed into a restricted complex when considering the ditches. This was detectable within all the methodology. Spatial patterns have been observed in regards to Roman villas. Ingold's journey at Skatnes was lengthy and very descriptive, and the Hillier methodologies tell of a highly controlled and exacting structure. The wider implications for archaeological method in general used here and discussions of social difference between Iron Age and Roman period communities in Britain are, it seems, when placed into practice, very exacting of the many preconceived parameters that are currently understood about the two cultures. But these preconceived, these preconceived parameters are wrong about one issue. It was not until the discussion, which I am not including here, when under the headings, how different the sites are using the methodology, was it truly detected how starkly different the two sites were? The Scatness structure projects um, the indication that insiders and outsiders were much more controlled than those at the ditches, which was to say the least a shock for myself in no un understated term. At Scatness, after being overpowered by the experience, the sensual perception of light and dark could be detected as a controlling factor. Moving from the light into the darkness was then a controlling element of where to move next. You were at, you were to be manipulated. As the insiders and outsiders alike accustom themselves to the darkness, they are drawn to the new light experience. Light is used to control. The levels of depth, the further you enter phase 5b, the less ability there is to escape. And again, light is used to control movement. This concept is undeniably present that could even be postulated as a barrier to free movement in Ingold. Ingold does not agree with barriers, but I'm sure he would um, admit that there's a barrier to free movement in these dark structures in the Iron Age. At the ditches, accessibility in phase two seemed to be a requirement of the owners. Light was used in a positive way. Um, we've got other analysis like gamma analysis, which we will come on to now quickly. You enter here and you can radiate. This is the gamma analysis. Um, this is the quickest route in. But in fact, you go from, a, um, you go from light, darkness, heading towards light, and then you're drawn to another light over here. You can see the dark parameters of this Iron Age world. Don't see anything like this in a Roman structure. Um, change. With a landscape witness, witnessing a period of intense change, where it is that wood, the preferred building material, is replaced as the predominant materials of scatness and the ditches, with lithic and the non-natural. Although timber was continued to be used, except in ever-decreasing amounts, there are structural parallels. But built, uh, both buildings were cleaned out, Small fragments of artefacts that fell between the cracks indicated this, and no midden waste was contemporary with, occupa uh, with occupation was uh, indicated either, and other similarities are coincidental. Probably need to rewrite that bit. These similarities are the cause and effect of buildings being constructed by a people with a newfound status or influenced by culture. The colour yellow within the landscape from a visual perspective within Ingold is a more important aspect than could have formerly been realised. I'd have loved to have explored that. Um, you can see basically, actually I did see this gamma analysis, phase two, you've got the other one, phase two, at scat, there's gamma analysis, the ditches, phase two, gamma analysis. You head into the structure, you can either go directly out, um, quickest route, the Navaranda, this is stage two, you can go in, you, there's exits, there's lights pouring in, there's doorways, you compare this, if we go back uh, with this experience, that there's no no contrast. It's, it's completely there's completely separate worlds. Um, here we go, and I've just missed something a minute. Um, and here we go. Finally, outcomes. Archaeology currently is written and performed in the past by able-bodied people. The methodologies used here within Ingold and Rappaport are suitable to develop some ability to test the sensual experience at archaeological sites 
further in regards to other categories of individuals and groups in society. Here, it should be repeated that the past is a stage that has performances upon it by actors. The archaeologists of the audience with varying interpretations, a useful statement adapted from Rappaport. Um, it was also detected, however, that a major fault with Ingold's work is that the past does not need to be as complex as he states. Any journey could be as simple as Hillier's analytical work, a route from A to B. It's that simple. All methodologies agree on one key issue. The past is a journey that can be recorded as a series of circles along a routeway um, or a sense of line, which is explored a little bit further back. Um, Hillier methodologies used here, um, if given to some level of humanity, i.e. rooms indicated in the mapping models that are not accessible due to hazards, could also be in the main offer some understanding of the experience for disabled members of society through any age. Each and every animate uh, created has in fact an internal map of routeways, Ingold, that are as varied as could ever be conceived. Artifacts are time vehicles to obtain a more complete sensual experience of the data sets available at many as of yet excavated archaeological sites. Materials such as stone, brick, and hard ETC could be sampled to demonstrate in a more appropriate manner past societies. And I'm always reminded of the disgust I see at Roman sites when people just stack up Roman tile and chuck it in ditches after excavation and do not e examine it. And here we go. Thanks for listening. Many thanks to Dr. Simon Clark, all the staff at UHI who have guided me, and my partner Michelle Harry for getting me this far. And just one last note here. I was in the archive at the Corinian Museum. And uh, one thing that I felt I was on the right track was when I picked out this artifact. It was about so big, you can see the scale. And there is a thumbprint, somebody with a thumb, the same size as mine. There, you can see the lines, there, there, and there. These, these are bits of archaeology that we would not really see interpreted, but interpreted by Hillier. But these are bits of archaeology we would see interpreted by the likes of Ingall, real archaeology. Things that are sometimes ignored. Ar um, archaeology bringing the archaeologist back to the archaeology itself. Um, and to have a tiny bit of bowl here, um, from, um, which was being eroded into the sea from the Iron Age. This is texture. This is a piece of archaeology. Um, and coming to the end of this now, as I have, or I'm going to this next week, um, it's been a good journey. Um, thanks to UHI for um, giving me the opportunity to take this journey. And thank you very much. Um, I wonder if we, we've been opening the questions to supervisors first, Simon, so do you want to have a question or a comment for Carl James? Yeah, um, just, to, just to boil it down, uh, James, can you, um, what would you say were the, your, your kind of key findings about the villa versus the wheelhouse in terms of similarities and differences? And following up from that, what did, how, how does the two methodologies make you see them differently? Do, do, does it make a difference which, which, which methodology you apply? Or are they actually are they coming, are they drawing you to the same conclusions, do you feel? Unfortunately, they are drawing to the same conclusion because the sense of the circle is used by all of the, um, the individuals here. All, all um, Foster, Hillier, Rappaport, Ingold, they use the sense of the circle to sort of key events. So there's that sense of unity and methodology. And I, and I think in a way they lead you to the right direction because I think uh, Hillier is actually saying to Ingold there is a more simplistic way of looking at the past, but Ingold is saying there's more of a complicated way of looking at the past, but you can narrow them down and you can actually get some sensibility. The past isn't as complicated as archaeologists think, and it is as complicated as archaeologists think at the same time. Um, and the sense of light as well, um, the stark difference between scatness um, and um, the ditches is the use of light. Um, the Romans enter the building with light. It, it's the ability to be able to see, to be able to go places. At scatness, whoever is responsible at scatness for the broch, 
for those small structures is wanting you to go to where they want you to. You cannot see in those structures when there's no light. Um, and um, the, the, the stuff, the, there are similarities. Um, the, the material is similar. Uh, the sense of wanting to move on. Uh, you might see that um, Scatness moves from a timber structure to a stone structure. The ditches moves from a timber structure to a stone structure. You've got those similarities. Um, weirdly enough, where you might find multi-storey structures, which I haven't done, you, you can see that at somewhere like Scatness, but you can't see it at the ditches. Um, and the methodologies have really helped. Um, but I, I think I've, I've come to the same conclusion. Um, when we look at the disability bit at the end, I know that's a, an, a, 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 a place to go. Um, Helia does not learn, allow you the opportunity to look at texture, where Ingold does. So those are the stark differences. Hopefully I've answered some of your questions. Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's about the degree of, of simplification or boulderization, yes. representation yes. in sense. Yes, I, I think, think we can get simplification, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think um, the other thing, obviously, that was very was uh, was quite startling. Well, I think for you when you came was the materiality of the site and and the fact that maybe the publications don't really convey that. Oh yeah, uh, I, 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 do you know? Do you know, Simon? Um, I know we feel directly on this. If if I uh, that's one point uh, which which I might actually put put in there. I I, I think I actually put it in somewhere that um, when you when you look at the publication. At, and this is actually in the when you look at the publication of Dockerel 2015, looking at Scatness, it's a wonderful publication, wonderful photographs. You go to somewhere like Scatness, and they've made a hell of a mess with the um, consolidation and reconstruction there. It does not broadcast what the archaeology is about. Within the archaeology, um, there are entrances and exits. Um, now, within, within the reconstruction, there are entrances and exits which were never. Um, indicated in the archaeology, whereas at, Sc whereas at ditches they've excavated and backfilled for future generations to examine. As far as I'm concerned, Scatness is a good um, is is a good demonstration of a site that should be simply backfilled for future generations to enjoy and not to be left eroding in the state that it is. Okay, I'll let somebody else have a crack now. Uh, the two approaches are interesting. <clears throat> the thing that springs to mind is the temporality of Ingold is about biography. It's about it's about it's a it's diachronic. It's a diachronic approach. Yeah. And that access so analysis not. access analysis by its by by default is synchronic. It's about trying to unravel a pattern of movement your, yeah. that it is in one period. Yeah. So they stand at odds to each other, and it, I think the combination of the two is actually potentially really useful. I don't know whether you've actually looked at the biography of Structure 12 at Scatness to try and bring out any of the sort of changes that happened to the access. And uh, yeah, I have. Like I have. Um, yeah, I, I've got that because in the, uh, in, in the phase... In fa OK, I, I had to go with... Uh, that's okay. Yeah. We've got See, phase one and phase two. I, I've got that in there. And there are changes. Yeah. Do you know what I was going to do? And I, and I don't know if I mentioned this to Simon. I, I was going to bend the, the truth a little bit. I, to make it easy, I was just going to say that, you know, uh, the peers at the back... Um, um, of the wheelhouse um, at structure 12 um, were never closed up. So I was going to go on to phase two and say they always remained open. And I thought, this is nuts. I can't make this up. So I, I, I closed them up. And in fact, when you did close them up, um, they, looking at the archaeology, they, they didn't make much of a difference. Um, because what... It, what um, what, what I've done with Ingold, I, I, I've taken the, the best route as an insider going to the half um, and into structure eight. So that's Ingold. And, I, and with Hillier and Hansen, this is an interesting thing which is in there. Hillier and Hansen takes us from the, um, from the new entranceway um, in the east by the Brock, and he takes us um, through um, cell five, and he takes us into the communal space, and he takes us then into structure eight. So it's exactly the same journey. It's the easiest, quickest way for both Ingold and Helio and Hansen. So there are parallels there. A to B. I don't know where if Helio and Hansen or Ingold ever have been visited Old Scatness Park. You're, you're understanding. I have, been, yes. yes. You're, you're, yeah. you're assuming the role of them. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I don't... Mm, interesting. One, one thing that I find interesting is you're privileging the sense of vision. 
overall. So when you talk about the darkness and light inherent within yeah. old Scatman structure, twelve verses, the villa, yeah. imagine them. Yeah, you, you're privileging one sense over others, and the one sense that one of the senses of experience, one of the dimensions of experience, is knowledge. Yeah, and so people know where things are. Yeah, people they, they don't necessarily <laughs> need absolute floodlit conditions to know where things are to find their way around the building, particularly if they have experience of it. And maybe the villa is geared up to a wider pool of visitors and mm. people who are less au okay with the specifics and the particular architectural dynamics of that building, even though, of course, there are patterns and traditions within villa architecture, as they are within the community who's going to be present within Structure 12, who are fundamentally going to be people who use that building on a day-to-day basis, mm. primarily with occasional visitors and people added to the household through time, obviously. But it strikes me that the, the, you mentioned... Your very end point mentions texture and you mention fingerprints and you mention the haptic qualities of human life. And I think that's an aspect that could come out in terms of people who are physically uh, making contact with buildings in a wider range of senses than just simply the visual and the light and the dark. And and your plan of the villa versus structure 12, I'm not sure that the villa is more open and less differentiated because there's an awful lot of chambers, there's an awful lot of rooms within that villa and anyone in one of those rooms of that villa doesn't really know what's going on in one of the other rooms so there's, there's just as much potential for control regulation, access and the expression of, of authority I would have thought within that villa structure unless I'm missing something which I may well be in relation to villas <laughs> <laughs> I think what you, what you also need to be aware of when you apply something like Hillier and Hansen, which is essentially a closed system, is it depends on your perspective. It depends where you start the story. So do you start, the, do you start your access map uh, at the gate to the wider enclosure or to the, or to the entrance to a specific building? And it, that will change your sense of, of depth within a complex and, and whether it's got multiple routes through it and things like that very much. So... Um, for me, for me, Hillier and Hansen, it's, it's a very, very stripped back description of connectivity, and it and it, it does away with with ideas of, of of texture and things like that. But, but even more basic things. When you when we were going through uh, the Alshof site, I took you through that very, very constrained doorway, yeah. which is clearly a very, very different experience from going through the larger doorway that most of the most of the um, uh, the visitors into the, uh, the modern day visitors into that that particular wheelhouse uh, went in. You know, if you actually have to move your shoulders sideways and get down on your hands and knees to get into a space, it's a different experience of connectivity than if you're walking in upright without without any any constraint to your body. So uh, it, it, it's it, it tells one aspect of the story, um, but it's stripping away all sorts of other information. What it's very good at doing is, is, is thinking about sequence and, and uh, encounter. Um, uh, and Hillier and Hansen are also quite sophisticated in that they do allow for the possibility of what they call secret ways, so that certain routes could be closed off to certain classes of people, that you know, only the servants go through certain passageways or whatever, and a, and a, and a formal visitor uh, coming into the, to the site would, would be taken through a completely different monumental fr- route through a complex, so you can't look at all the people. Kind okay, of different, yeah. But 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 yeah. It, I mean, Hillier and Hansen actually talk about you know the house as a machine, uh, and as as I say, um, Ingold obviously is much, it has a much more personal, uh, you know, personal encounter uh, with 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 place and, and so on, uh, much less abstract as well, obviously. Yeah, and movement's only one dimension of inhabiting a building because the occupancy, the stasis, there's the stability of, of residency that comes with doing things in a particular space that lays down an accretion of practices and routines and tasks, yeah. as so, well so as the, deposits that so influence that's, it. You know, so it, it, there's temporality of, within that, all, arguably, as well. Everything's yeah, versus, yeah. you know. Yeah, so, I mean, Hillier Hansen is talking about built space as a kind of a, a, a conscious construct, whereas a lot, of, a lot of the constraints within a human environment are actually about um, systems that build themselves, you know, paths that are formed not by somebody laying tarmac, but by animals or people finding a way through the landscape and, 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 and creating it through multiple periods of use. So it's a, 
it's uh, it's you know the the pattern of life creating the space rather than the the, the pattern of the space forming the pattern of life. If you see what I mean. Um, you talked about um, well, you mentioned uh, societality or <laughs> the pronunciation of it escapes me and uh, phenomenology and such like. I'm glad you can say it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, have you thought about uh, slaves moving through uh, an open Roman villa, and then you talk about the uh, the closeness of the uh, all of the houses up at Old Scatness and how they're all one on top of each other. I mean, if they were if they were free people who were um, a sort of one cohesive community of free people, uh, what is what is uh, what is um, what are you looking at as far as society is concerned? Slaves moving uh, through an open building, or a group of free people living um, cheek to jowl? Uh, the, 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 the thing is, um, it has to go with the differ- differentiation of what a slave is. You know, we're slaves in this modern day society to everything around us. Um, where in, in Roman society in Roman Britain, the, the concept of a slave would have been very different from the concept of the slave. Um, on the continent. Well, the, the point that I'm trying to make um, is that these overpowering structures, these huge, grey, overpowering structures, if you go to somewhere like, um, if you go to somewhere um, like Musa, um, you'll be overpowered by this huge structure. And the, the, the point I'm trying to make <coughs> is that you cannot just think that these structures are for um, nice little people going on with their over- everyday lives. I do not buy that for one minute. I do not believe that the Iron Age was a nice, nice landscape to live in. But I'm a, I would say that um, I'm a Roman archaeologist as well, and I would say that um, Roman Britain would have been a far nicer place to live, but then that's a big debate between loads of us in the room, and Martin's going to completely disagree, and so are you, but this is... Um, this, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't it's have more, to be a nice... It's, yeah. it's not two cultures, that's the thing. It, it's a much finer grain yes. set of experiences. Everyone in Roman Britain, everyone in Iron Age, Northern Scotland, will have had their own experience in yeah. life. And I'm, I'm not sure that it's our role necessarily to place a moral value yeah. on the rectitude of the Roman province versus this, Iron This Age is one thing I've done. Yeah. And, and, and to be honest with you, I think some people have had hellish lives and I think some people have had really nice lives. Yes. And it's not like there's Fact been... I think the Iron Age has had decades of being painted as a horrible, violent, nasty, brutish play, you know, and it's only in the last 25, 30 years that there's been some moderation of the concept of the mm-hmm. Iron Age not being a hellish place to be. You know, this so is... actually to go back and say, oh no, actually it is hellish, I yeah. think it's, it's, it's just over, it's, it, it's just, we don't need to see it in black and white terms. On the no, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, you know, when, before I entered this, I thought, you know, the Iron Age was a... Um, you know, Scatness was a nice place to be, and all the rest of it. And you know, I've, I've gone back the other way. So, but this, this, when when we're talking about this, uh, th- th- this is this is where this is where I've gone with the work, and obviously uh, the other things are another debate altogether, which we can leave for another time. <laughs> yes, because <laughs> we've run out of time. <laughs> okay, um, thanks very much, um, Carl James, and thank you to everybody who's presented today, um, and for those of you who've come along to listen. Um, it's only a week to go, so any last minute questions can be directed to me in terms of submission and such like. For those of you who are not full time students and are here for a bit longer, and those of you who are watching on recording, um, Jen will be taking over as of next Friday for the module leadership. Um, so any questions can go to Jen, um, although I'm continuing on as supervisor. So those of you that I'm currently supervising don't have a panic. Um, <laughs> um, I'll still be doing that for, for you. Okay, so um, thank you very much and have a nice weekend. And I'll probably hear from most of you in the coming week, I imagine. If not, I'll be acknowledging receipt of dissertations next week. Do, do I still send it to you at uh, 4.59 and 30 seconds? If you want, yeah, I'll still be here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank anyway, you. Thank, thank you. Thanks thank for you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Take care. Cheers. This call has been disconnected. Thank you for joining.